It's so good to see you guys. I want to apologize in advance for whoever has to look at my backside, which is everyone at some point. So, see there? Look at that. Um, it's really good to be with you guys. Um, thank you, um, thank you, Rick, for the, the invitation to be here. This is fantastic, and we're so happy to be home for a little bit of time. Um, we uh, moved two years ago, almost exactly two years ago, to Manhattan, and uh, our are growing and learning in that place. Um, we, I'm working for an organization called Redeemer City to City that helps train church planters to uh, be successful in ministry in some of the most difficult church planting contexts, which, which are big international cities like uh, Manhattan or Paris or Amsterdam or Tokyo and those kinds of places where the risk is high and the failure rate is high. And, um, and our goal is to get them not just to plant a church, but to plant a church and then to work with others to create a network of church planting churches, right? So we're trying to start a movement, which is a, uh, you know, it's a huge, ridiculous sort of goal. And it's really exciting to see what God is doing around the world. So we love being there. We really love being back. Thank you for having us. And um, we've been asked quite a few times already, and someone else will ask again uh, what life in New York City is like. And um, I, was, I just remembered in the drive over here that our son, who is seven, for the first year we lived in New York, he would start memories by saying, do you remember when we used to live in America? Um, <laughs> and so, you know, it's different there. Um, I had to remind him, we still live in America, and he's like, no. So, um, here are, there are a couple of ways to answer the question, what is life like? It's, uh, I did a little bit... Of, here are some numbers for the numbers people. Uh, Conway is 46 square miles with about 60,000 people. Manhattan has a, a land area of 22 square miles and has 1.6 million people, which means uh, that Manhattan is half the size of Conway and has 25 times the population. Um, during the day, the population of Manhattan doubles because people come in for work from all around, and there's more than three million people uh, on the island, which is roughly equivalent to the population of the entire state of Arkansas. Um, so if you want to know what life is like in Manhattan, just imagine the entire state of Ar Arkansas living west of Donaghy and then trying to do anything. <laughs> like, that's what it's like. Um, so it's... An adventure, uh, life is different. Um, and then all of those people in the morning squeeze themselves into the subway and like speed underground to work. And uh, the subway is a particularly terrible place to be this time of year because it's hot and uh, there's air conditioning on the subway, but it doesn't really do the trick. And so if you want to know what that's like, there is an experiment that you can do at home. And it goes like this. Um, all you need is a bathroom and uh, a bunch of strangers, people you don't know. Um, if you have two bathrooms, choose the smaller, grosser one, and turn the hot water on in your bathroom for like 30 minutes until it gets really steamy, and then just start inviting people in, right? <laughs> and tell them you can't look at each other, you can't talk to each other. Close the door and tell them the door will open in four minutes, <laughs> and then open the door in like 25 minutes. <laughs> and then when you open the door, let one person out and six people in, okay? <laughs> And it's best if the person that leaves is like in the tub with a golf bag or something and has to, you know, bump everybody on their way out. So, so that's the subway experience. And on the weekends, if you want to add that, you could invite somebody to play a trumpet or the drums or something in your bathroom. And that's kind of what it's like. So um, I have, we have learned, joking aside, that living in the city, commuting in the subway, which is a cultural experience on its own, really is an opportunity to kind of reflect on our Christian faith in a new way. Um, because a lot of situations have come up in the city that I have never experienced in the rest of my life, right? So uh, one morning commute, for example, I, uh, a very small and very drunk man uh, threatened to m murder me on the subway for like about 15 minutes. And um, he was very specific, I'm going to stab you and nobody will stop me, you know, and the whole thing. And I, I'm not a real physical guy, but he was very small and three sheets to the wind at eight in the morning. And so I thought if it comes right down to it, I think I like my odds. And so 
So I wasn't scared for my life, but I was thinking, like, on the commute, you know, as you do, I was thinking um, two things. One is, uh, should, is it legal to shove him out at the next stop? Or, like, how much would it take to fit him through the little subway window, you know? Um, so that's one train of thought. And then the other was, uh, what would Jesus do, you know, in a situation like this? And I, for the life of me, could not think of a parable that helped me in this situation. Nothing about drunk people in the Bible. Nothing about subways in the Bible. Um, and so, it, but it got, got me thinking that we do face a lot of situations in life where we want to follow Scripture, we want to follow Jesus, but the Bible doesn't actually tell us exactly what to do in a situation like drunk man threatens your life on the subway, right? So, like, what's the Christian response here? Um, and so I started thinking, like, well, Jesus says stuff, and maybe one of the things applies. He says, turn the other cheek, right? So that could apply. He also says, I didn't come to bring peace but a sword, right? So like, maybe that applies in this situation. <laughs> Um, I've seen at least one person on the subway with a sword, so that's definitely a possibility. And Jesus says other weird stuff, like, if you don't eat my body and drink my flesh, then you don't have any part of me, and that doesn't really help. But once you're kind of thinking through the, you know, data, um, your mind goes weird places. So the point is, I just had to wonder, is there, do you get to the point where you know Jesus well enough that you, you know what to do in a scenario when there's no clear teaching on what am I supposed to do right this minute, right? Is there a way to get to that point that you're close enough, you're walking close enough with Jesus that, that you know how to act in these situations? And I think the answer is absolutely. But when I check myself, I realize that I gravitate in my response to those kinds of quotes from Jesus that I like the best or that like suit my temperament or that fit my worldview, right? So like some people would be more likely to turn the other cheek and then say everybody ought to turn the other cheek. And some people would be more likely to say, no, it's the sword one, and then tell everybody that that's what they should do, right? So the who Jesus is really sometimes for us is who we want him to be, right? And so we look at Jesus through some filter, our experience or our culture, and we end up looking at a Jesus that looks an awful lot like us, right? And that doesn't actually help us all that much. So what I want us to do tonight is look at a passage that addresses this that has become really important for me. It's in the book of John. It's in chapter 6. If you have some uh, device, let, who are we joking? Nobody has a Bible. So um, we get a device. What you can't do with a, I think I said that wrong, but if we don't have a, it's hard in a Bible to, it's hard in a digital Bible to read two places at once. But if you can do that, we're in Exodus and we're in uh, John chapter 6. So I'm going to read, a, uh, we're going to look at a passage it's about looking at Jesus through the right lens. And um, I'm going to read the passage and then pray and we'll jump in. So this is John chapter 6, verses 1 to 15. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up, Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There's plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. And Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Father, we are thankful for your word, and we're thankful that it brings clarity um, and that you promise to lead us if we look here for your direction. And so we, we pray tonight 
that you would speak to us, that you would help us to look into our own hearts as we look into your word, and uh, that you would help us to see Jesus more clearly. And we pray this in his name. Amen. All right. So in the previous chapter, chapters of John leading up to this, Jesus spoke to a Samaritan woman by a well about living water, and he healed the son of a royal official. He even healed a man who was laying beside a pool that um, it, it bubbled occasionally, and people hoped that if they got in, that they could be healed. And this man couldn't get in, but Jesus healed him anyway. And then he headed across the Sea of Galilee to get some distance from the crowd. And the Bible doesn't tell us how quickly all of these things happen. It just tells us here sometime after this or after these things. So we don't know exactly the timeline, but we know that Jesus is under a lot of pressure because the religious leaders are trying to kill him at this point. Um, the crowds just want more miracles and they want more signs. They want to see more from Jesus. And what Jesus wants is to go away with his disciples and process the things that they've seen to help them understand what they've witnessed. So he and his close friends get in a boat, they sail across the lake, and they go up on a mountainside to talk. And it's late in the afternoon. And then here in the middle of the action, there's a detail that feels like an interruption. And it says the Jewish festival of Passover was drawing near. It's a kind of detail that's easy to skip over, and we might want to just skim past it. But it's actually the part of the story that kind of helps everything to make sense. So before we go into the story, I just want to take a look at the Passover. Uh, Passover was and still is a really important celebration uh, in Israel and for Jews today. Uh, and the, it's a celebration of Israel's independence from Egypt. They were slaves for hundreds of years in Egypt, and then God sent through... Uh, a series of miracles, he, he liberated them. And Passover became the sort of emblem of that salvation. But it's not just a day, it's an actual, it's an eight-day festival. And then about a month after the Passover festival is Pentecost, which is a celebration of uh, the gift of the law that God gave the, uh, to Moses on the mountain in the wilderness. In other words, it's not just like a day on the calendar that you might miss. It's a season like Christmas where there's anticipation and there's buildup, and you don't just wake up on the 25th and go, crap, is that today? Like, I didn't buy any gifts, right? You know it's coming from a long time because it, it's in the air and everybody's there. And so it's not all that important to us that the Passover festival was near, but it would have been very important to the people looking for Jesus that this is the time of Passover. Um, and so the event of Passover is associated with the human figure Moses, who is the person that God uses uh, to, to perform the miracles through, uh, through all of those stories. So through Mo Moses, God performs the miracles that result in Pharaoh letting the people leave. Through Moses, God parts the Red Sea so that the Israelites can escape from the armies of Pharaoh that are advancing. And then through Moses, God drowns those armies in the sea behind them. And then through Moses on the other side, God gives them water miraculously and provides for them in the wilderness. And eventually through Moses gives them the law. So Moses was Israel's supreme human hero, right? They knew God did all these things, but all of those things were associated with Moses as the prophet who helped to make them happen. And there are clues throughout the book of John that John wants us, every time we see something that Jesus does, to think about Moses. So right at the very beginning of the book, in chapter 1, uh, John says, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus. So he's linking them there. And then right before this passage in chapter 5, he says, For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, because Moses wrote about me. Right? So John wants us, when we look at Jesus, to look at Jesus through the lens of Moses. Right? It's like a set of glasses that we put on to see things clearly. John knows... As all of us know, uh, if we really are honest with ourselves, if we don't look, we all are going to look at Jesus through some lens, right? Our experience and our culture and whatever. And so John is giving us some tool to correct that. And so he's saying, um, when John tells us that the Jewish Passover festival was near, it's like he's saying, the show is about to start. Put on your glasses and pay attention to what Jesus is doing, right? He's giving us a clue. So we're going to read through Moses now, at the end, we'll explain what does it mean to read Jesus through Moses, but first, there are two wrong lenses, wrong ways to read Jesus that this story talks about first. And the first is the lens of low expectations. The lens of low expectations. 
So let's go back to the story. Jesus and his friends are up on the mountain. It's dinner time. They're debriefing. It's been a very short debrief because all the people that they left have now found them on the other side of the lake. Jesus apparently sees them coming before everybody else, and he, like, all casually hits Philip. He's like, you know, there's thousands of people coming. And, um, and he says, hey, uh, where will we buy bread to feed all of these people? And he directs the question at Philip. I don't know why, but it's a ridiculous question because there is no answer to that question that's not completely ludicrous, right? There's no way that any of the disciples will say, oh, yeah, there's a little shop at the bottom of the hill, right? We'll just go there. Or like, I saw a Panera on the lakeside, you know. Um, it's a ridiculous question because even if there was a place, there's no way that that place could meet the need, right? So there's little Jonah the baker and son of Jonah, his son, you know, and they're putting wood in the fire and Philip and Andrew show up and say, hey, we need, you know, like 30,000 loaves of bread to go. You know, like, how is that? So there's no way that that, the question doesn't make sense. It doesn't have an answer that makes any sense. There's no bakery in Galilee at the time. There's no bakery in America now that could produce that much bread to produce that kind of need right now, right? And yet, Jesus asks, where shall we go to buy bread? Jesus asks a lot of questions in John's Gospels. Very early on, one of the first disciples that follows him, Jesus turns around and says, what are you looking for? To a religious leader, he says, are you a teacher in Israel and you don't understand these things? And to the man beside the pool of Bethesda, he says, do you wish to get well? And these questions are not traps to trip them up, but they're tests because they're supposed to expose the thing that's on that person's heart right then. What's your instinctive response to this question, right? And so the question now on the mountaintop with all these people coming is designed, is, is designed to get the disciples to put on that filter of Moses. It's like Jesus is saying, okay, think of a time that God's people were in the wilderness up on a mountain getting the law from God, and everybody was hungry and there was nothing to eat. What happened then, right? So he's asking them to put on this lens of Moses. Where shall we buy bread? Philip is not interested in questions. And he says, it would take more than six months' wages to buy appetizers for these people. And you're talking about where are we going to get enough bread to feed them, right? Even if Jonah and Barjona down the hill could, like, <laughs> crank out 20,000 loaves of bread, we don't have the money to pay for it, right? It's a ridiculous question. And Jesus, it's like he's looking at Jesus and saying, that's nice, but that's the wrong question, right? You're asking the wrong question. The question isn't, where will we buy bread? The question is, even if we had a place to buy bread, how could we afford it, right? Andrew does slightly better. He says, here's a kid with some fish and bread, which is, he's off to a good start. And then he can't help himself and says, but it doesn't really matter because that's a little bit and we've got a lot of people, right? So Andrew fails the test. Philip and Andrew fail to read Jesus through the lens of Moses. They see him through some lens, but not the right one, right? Jesus is trying to prepare them to witness a miracle and to understand it. And they can only see Jesus through their own experience of scarcity and disappointment and low expectations, right? I don't know about you, but if I'm honest, I do this all the time, right? There are things that I know Jesus has well in hand, right? And then there are the things that are deep that I think, I don't, I don't know if Jesus can actually deal with that thing, right? The, I've been trained through my experience, picked it up in church and other places, to expect very little of Jesus, right? So that he wants to prepare us for a miracle, and I respond with, that's great, but you're asking the wrong question. Right? Or he wants to make us part of a blessing, and we say, that's fine, but it's such a small blessing, and the need is so big that I don't know how it matters. Right? And there are a lot of ways to end up with glasses like these, you know, bad teaching or bad experience. But I just we should examine ourselves, and when Jesus asks, you know, who will go serve the powerless and the brokenhearted? How many of us are prone to say, that's the wrong question? 
The right question is, when will I ever pay off my student loans, right? That's the right question. Or when will I find someone to marry me, right? That's the right question. Or what if my kids don't get into the right school? Or what if I'm stuck in this job that I hate forever? Those are the right questions. That other stuff is just too much. And a lot of us are too pious to ask those direct questions like that. So we spiritualize it and we say, yes, Lord, but doesn't your word also say that we shouldn't put the Lord our God to the test? You know, um, or say, yes, but doesn't Paul say that we should live, make it our ambition to live a quiet life and work with our, like, just lo- tamp it down, right? And these responses are all ways of protecting ourselves from disappointment. So we're not going to pray boldly for that need because we don't want to be disappointed when it doesn't go the way that we pray, right? (laughs) Usually I think you say go on, but that's, you know, whatever. Um, (laughs) (laughs) We don't want to take the next step of faithfulness because we don't want to be disappointed when we fail, right? So we protect ourselves with low expectations. And I think if I asked you to name that place of low expectation, that everyone in here has one of those, right? It's that place that Jesus doesn't quite touch. Um, And the problem with this lens of low expectations is that it makes Jesus appear smaller and smaller, right? It's like looking at Jesus through the wrong end of a telescope. The more you look this way, the smaller he gets, right? The good news is, that the disciples' low expectations are not enough to stop Jesus from doing the miracle that he plans to do, right? So he tells the folks to sit down. He's all casual about all this. I like that. Just sit down. Just grab a seat, you know. Brace yourself. Um, He blesses the food, and he breaks it, and he breaks it, and he hands it out, and he breaks it, and he hands it out. And he keeps doing this until everyone has not just had a bite, like Philip said, but they are full, and they've had enough. And then Jesus, I don't know if you guys read Smart Alec Jesus. I see it in there. That's me reading him through my lens. I get that, but I like it. So, so then Jesus says to Philip, who said there's not enough for everybody to have a bite, and to Andrew, who says, uh, yeah, well, there's these loaves and fishes, but it's not nearly enough for the need. He says, why don't we go ahead and get some baskets and collect all the leftovers? <laughs> yeah, why don't we just do that with your low expectations, right? Um, So Peter and Andrew and everyone else now knows the answer to the question, where will we buy enough bread to feed all of these people? The answer is nowhere. Just put on your lenses, look at Jesus, and pay attention, right? Because he's going to show us something. So that's one response. Then there's another group that responds a different way, the crowd. They look at Jesus through another lens, which is the lens of ambition. So... We have a bunch of people here who have full tummies, and they've just witnessed the miracle, and their immediate response sounds like the right response, which is, surely this is the prophet that God promised to send, right? It's a good religious answer, and it's actually reading Jesus through the Old Testament. There was this promise, and here comes the fulfillment, and so they're nearly right, Um, but we get the sense that they're wrong at the very end of the passage, where it says that uh, they plan to make Jesus king by force. So like it or not, we're going to make you king, right? Um, I think we should do presidential elections that way in 2020. Like, let's go find the people that want it the least, and maybe they're good at it. I don't know. I think it's just like, go find them, get all the ambition out of it, you know. Um, But it's a great idea if you think about it, because think of what Jesus has done in the last few chapters. He's healed sick people from a distance. He's made lame people walk. Now he has filled tummies in the wilderness where there was no food, and if the main job of a king is to lead people into battle, who better than somebody who can fix broken bodies and fill empty stomachs and then send them back into battle, right? It's a great person to be king. Doesn't matter what his other policies are, right? If you can do all that stuff, just do it. But at the end of the day, the crowd is making the same mistake that the disciples made, because they aren't reading Jesus through the right lenses. They're reading him through the lenses of their own ambition. They want to be free. They want political freedom. They have been under Roman rule for a while now, and they want out, much like their ancestors in Egypt wanted out. 
And while that's a, a fine ambition, when they look at Jesus, they see somebody who can do that for them, and that's all they can see, is somebody that can make them free in that way that they want to be free. So this is the flip side of the lens of low expectations. Low expectations assume you've got a problem that Jesus can't solve, and that's obviously wrong. The lens of your own ambition means that you've got plans in life, you've got places to go and things to accomplish, and Jesus' job is just to make all that stuff work out for you, right? The first lens puts way too little faith in Jesus. And the second lens puts way too much faith in ourselves because it assumes that we know exactly what we need and Jesus' job is just to make it happen, right? We do this in big ways and we do it in small ways. We want to get married. Jesus' job is to get us married. We want to start a a new business. Jesus' job is to, you know, make it work. We want to win back the House or Congress. Jesus, get on that. We want to liberate the oppressed. Get on that. And these ambitions are not bad or wrong. Marriage is good. Work is good. Justice is good. Family and sanctity of life is good. But when it becomes Jesus' sole job to accomplish those things for us, we're reading Jesus through the wrong lens, right? Reading Jesus this way actually reduces him too. And it makes him smaller and smaller. So instead of looking at Jesus through the lens of low expectations or through the lens of ambition, what would we see if we looked at Jesus through the lens of Moses, which is what John's trying to get us to do? So let's go back to Passover for just a second, to Exodus. In chapter 12, Exodus 12 is the Passover meal where the Israelites put the blood of a lamb on the doorpost and the angel of death passes through and spares the Israelites who have the blood on their doors. Chapter 14 is the Red Sea. Chapter 15, God provides water in the desert. And then in chapter Exodus chapter 16, God provides meat and bread in the wilderness. And Moses, way back in Exodus, tells the people how to interpret this miracle. He says, in the evening when you get the gift of meat, you will know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning with the gift of bread you will see the glory of the Lord. So the meat and the bread are a sign of God's salvation and glory. But when we read it through Moses, we recognize that in Exodus, God gives the people meat and bread through Moses. And in John, Jesus gives the people meat and bread all by himself. When we look through the lens of Moses, we see that Jesus doesn't remind us of the Passover lamb. Jesus is the Passover lamb. Jesus doesn't give the bread and living water. He is the bread from heaven and the living water that never runs dry. Jesus doesn't just keep and model the law. He is the perfect wisdom of God. He's not just a prophet sent by God to fulfill a promise. He is that promise that the whole Bible is pointing to. And he's not just a human being who can overcome some of our challenges, but not all of them. And he's not a genie in a bottle to help us achieve our ambitions He's the all-powerful and ever-present God of the universe, and he makes that God close to us. He gives us access to that power and that presence, which is to say that every lens we view Jesus with that isn't this one is going to make him smaller and smaller and smaller. But if we read him like this as the fulfillment of everything that God started and promised to complete, then Jesus gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The story keeps going. It doesn't stop. Jesus, like, gets in a boat again and takes off. Like, there's no rest in the story. He just keeps performing miracles and doing amazing things. There's no application in John. It's not like the uh, letters of Paul where he says, therefore, in light of all this, go do things. He just keeps, the story just keeps rolling on. But there are at least three things that I think we can take away from this story. Uh, And the first is this, that the most important questions are not the questions that we ask Jesus, but the questions that Jesus asks us. I'm a big fan of questions. I always ask a lot of questions. It used to irritate my dad, and I didn't understand why, but now I have a seven-year-old, and I get it, because the questions never stopped. And we we just flew 
from New York to here, and it's like, well, how do, why do the wings bend that way? And what does our luggage go when they put it on the thing? And how does that work? And what does that button do? And I think, good Lord, I would be happy to not answer another question or even ask one, you know, for a great length of time. But in general, <laughs> as a professor, as a writer, in my role developing resources now, I ask a lot of questions. I encourage other people to ask questions. If you're a person of faith who asks questions and don't feel like that's a safe thing to do, I'm telling you it's a safe thing to do. Ask the questions. But understand that the most important questions are not your questions, but they're the questions that Jesus asks us to wrestle with. Questions like, where are we going to find enough bread to feed all these people? Or, who do you say that I am? Right? These are questions that we have to keep coming back to because our lenses keep changing, right? We keep finding new ways to get things wrong. So the first one is the questions. The second is we need to be aware of our lenses. And this is hard because I'm asking us to be aware of something that we were previously not aware of. And so the problem with fixing something you can't see is that you can't see it, right? You're with me like there's a conundrum here. So, but let me give you an illustration uh, that's r relevant and recent. Um, for as long as I've been married, which is approaching 15 years, I've had a swimsuit that I like very much. Um, and um, this is very important. I don't know why you're laughing. Um, the, uh, from the moment I got these, this swimsuit, I was about to say trunks, but nobody does that right anymore. Uh, so the, from the moment I got this swimsuit, my wife told me Those are, that's an old man swimsuit, and you need to get rid of it and get a proper swimsuit. But I don't know why she doesn't like it. It's, got, it's like cargo. They've got, you know, pockets for my stuff, which is fantastic. <laughs> I know. It sits right. It knows where to go. You know what I'm saying? Like, it just kind of. So it's functional and fashionable. It's everything, right? So the, um, then a couple weeks ago, we went to the beach, and I was standing in the surf watching my kids play. And I looked around. And I saw all these old men wearing my swimsuit. <laughs> It's the best day of Amy's life. <laughs> not, a, not a great day for mine. Um, but then I saw it. I saw what she has seen for all these years, right? And once you see that kind of thing, you just can't unsee it. So, like, it's, it's a revelation. And this... There's a point here that the, there's a challenge in correcting things that you can't see because you can't see them. And even sometimes other people try to help you see them, and you, you just refuse. You just can't, right? So how do we know if we're looking at Jesus through the wrong lens? Here's a test. If the Jesus that you're looking at always affirms your biases and always reinforces your preferences and always comforts you and never confronts you, then you are looking at Jesus through the wrong lens. At the same time, if the Jesus you're looking at always shames you for your sin and always makes you feel dirty and small and always confronts you and never comforts you, then you are looking at Jesus through the wrong lens. We only get to see these different sides of Jesus by being close to him and let him letting him ask us the questions that he needs to ask us so that we can be aware of our lenses. And the last thing is, we never outgrow our need for Jesus. So for a long time, I thought that my relationship with God was similar to my relationship with my dad, which is my earthly dad, which is that um, the older I get and the more mature I get, one sign of becoming more mature is that I won't rely on him for everything, right? So I, there's not a time when I don't need him, but I don't, I, I don't need him to call my teacher, and I don't need him to sign a report card. or You know, like you get older, and you just rely on them for certain things less and less, right? And I thought that the same thing was true in my spiritual life, that the more I mature I get, I shouldn't have to always ask, like, what's the right thing to do in this situation? Because I've gotten older and wiser and more mature, and so I got this. And, like, Jesus is the sort of, you know, catastrophic insurance or whatever in case something goes off the rails. But, like, I should have, I should have this at some point. But the secret of the Christian life that I'm learning over and over and over again is that the goal is not to get better and try harder and to do more without 
God, but to constantly see Jesus as bigger and bigger and bigger. And when that happens, we realize that our reliance doesn't go down as we mature, it goes up. And we never outgrow our need for Jesus. So as Jesus gets bigger, we let the Holy Spirit point out those lenses of pain and disappointment or ambition, and we take them back to Jesus and let him do with them what only he can do. And when that happens, we realize that the question, where will we buy bread for all these people to eat, is really just another way to ask, where can we find everything that we need? And the answer, of course, is in Jesus. Let me pray. Father, we're thankful for your word, and we're thankful that you are patient with us because, um, you know, we make mistakes in, in different directions, and you don't judge us by our performance. You, um, you meet us in your grace, and we are so thankful that, that our relationship uh, with you is not based on what we can accomplish for you, but on the invitation to just be closer to you all the time. We pray that you would be bigger and bigger and bigger in everyone's eyes here, that you would help us to see new depths uh, that we've missed before, and that you would welcome us into that uh, depth with you. And uh, we thank you in advance for what you want to do in all of us. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.